This is Jeff Dice, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast. We are getting deeper and deeper into our uh, walk through this incredible book, Mises' magnum opus, Human Action, which he wrote in the 1940s, and we're now moving into part four of that book. We have joining us our great friend from Grove City College, Dr. Jeffrey Herbner. He is, of course, the chair of the econ department there, a great friend of the Mises Institute. He's been there a, a fair amount of time. He knew the late Hans Senholz. He received his PhD from Oklahoma State University and is a, a very prolific writer and speaker for us and for Grove City as, as a, a well-known Austrian you know, Jeff, as I as I look at part four of this book, which is really, you know, very, very meaty, has some very meaty sections, and we've been trying to get people interested in reading along. We provide some links with the show here to get the, the book itself uh, very, very cheaply. Uh, you can read it for free online in HTML format. Uh, and a lot of people are home right now. A lot of people have some spare time. A lot of people are wondering what to do or how to think about what's going on. Uh, we have both a fiscal and a monetary policy that is absolutely crazed. At this point, the Treasury is getting ready to literally send checks to American citizens. The Fed is cranking up trillions of dollars in new money and credit. And we are simply untethering in people's minds the idea of how you get money and goods and services versus working and being productive. Uh, we're sending people checks in exchange for sitting at home. So this isn't World War II, folks. This is a very different and dangerous time in America. And I, I'm just seeing this morning an article of all places, my God, Teen Vogue, uh, how we can never go back to capitalism after this. You know, we can't go back to business as usual. I mean, we have an absolute epidemic of economic ignorance in this country, which is far beyond, uh, in, in terms of its threat, far, far beyond this virus, which we could handle, we could approach, you know, as a market and medical issue. We could quarantine the elderly and the affected, and we could get back to work. Uh, so there's never been a better time, in, in a sense, to avail yourself of the truth, to avail yourself of economic knowledge, and to simply not be another dummy in society. It, you know, it, that's a pretty low burden, and we all bear it. We all owe it to ourselves. We owe it to the wider society. We certainly owe it to our children and grandchildren to not be another dummy in society. So, uh, you know, we didn't plan on this uh, uh, financial and virus meltdown happening during this series of podcasts on the book, but nonetheless, it is. And uh, our guest, Jeffrey Herbner, is feeling the effects because, Jeff, it sounds like, as we were saying offline, that your students are now at home, your campus is shut down, and you are teaching online. Yes, that is certainly the case. And uh, I want to uh, thank you for having me on today. It's an honor to be part of this. And I've got to tell you that in sort of rereading uh, these chapters, skimming over them for uh, this session, it, it was ever more apparent to me how insightful Mises is uh, in application to this crisis that we're facing. It, his insights just sort of popped off the page um, uh, one, one by one that are directly applicable to, the, to this terrible, awful uh, government imposition that we're facing in this, in this time. Well, there, yeah, there are. There are quotes throughout here throughout these sections that we could apply today. I'm curious, though, do you recall how and when you first heard of this book and when you first read it? I uh, heard of this book uh, after my graduate studies. Um, I had been uh, always a free market economist, but didn't know of the Austrian uh, authors uh, before that. And uh, through a colleague, I uh, got involved in reading some Hayek. And so Hayek making references to Mises, then uh, it was just a progression to Mises from there. So I was uh, I was a young professor when I first uh, uh, encountered human action. So what era are we talking here? 80s, 90s? Yes, that's correct. In the in the mid 80s. Yeah. OK. OK. So section four, or I should say part four of the book. We've been through some earlier parts, some of the more philosophical stuff with David Gordon. We've had Bob Murphy on the show. We've had your colleague Sean Rittenauer on the show. We've had Per Bieland. Uh, on the show. So now we're getting into part four of the book. And, and let's start with, so it's called Catalactics or Economics of the Market Society. So right off the get-go, I'm sure for a lot of our readers and listeners, we have this unfamiliar term. So what, what's 
what's the definition? Because there seem to be more than one definition floating around, and, and there's a way that Mises uses it that perhaps is not the textbook definition. What is catalactics? Right. So Mises uh, uses the term catalactics to refer to the um, some of the activity that takes place on the market economy. So it is basically um, exchange, uh, the division of labor, uh, and all of the ancillary activity uh, connected with the market economy. And the reason that he defines it this way is uh, apparent when you look at part three. So in part three, he's talking about economic calculation, which is the phenomena of the market economy in decision making about resource use. <clears throat> and so now, uh, given that as uh, background, he wants to jump into uh, the functioning of the market economy itself, how uh, entrepreneurs are able to use economic calculation in order to make uh, efficient decisions about resource use for society at large. And so th this chapter, it, it, he stresses at several points that the concept of monetary calculation. So does that mean that catalactics is something that's beyond barter? It's, it's catalactics occurs when we are using money to exchange for goods and services. Yeah, exactly right. And that, that's what he emphasized in part three. That economic calculation is always monetary calculation. And as he explains throughout these chapters, the reason for this is that all human action, even market activity, is based upon a rank order of valuation. But rank order of valuations are subjective in the minds of people. And therefore, there's no possibility of interpersonal comparison of valuations. And because of that, um, we can't use these valuations in order to make decisions about how to use resources in a division of labor in the most value enhancing way, because we can't compare the subjective value that some consumers would get from the use of resources with the subjective value that other consumers would get from a different use of the resources. The only way that we can proceed uh, is to have uh, monetary calculation, have all of our preferences expressed for and against money. And then we can tell who values things uh, more relative to money then other people value the same things relative to money. And this can guide uh, entrepreneurs in efficient resource use. But for those who, who listen to part three with Per Beiland, Beeland, you recall that Per said this was a huge civilizational achievement, maybe on par with the development of the wheel or something like that, when people could actually start to calculate and think about things in monetary terms as opposed to barter, let's say, which is obviously a very difficult system. Uh, that this this actually has huge ramifications for human society. And how many how many sociologists, I know you teach sociology as well, how many sociologists or political scientists ever even think about this, that, that you know, monetary calculation is a human achievement? Probably not many. Right. This is unknown outside of economics, I would, largely unknown. Uh, there, there are a few soci sociologists, uh, professors here at Grove City College that do, in fact, uh, grasp this important point. And Mises, again, peppers... Uh, uh, this uh, point uh, throughout this section where he doesn't refer to monetary calculation uh, sometimes per se, but he talks about how capitalism is necessary for civilization. But in order to have capitalism, we have to have monetary calculation. Yeah, and, and it's amazing. We have a great friend of the Institute, John Lang, who's really into evolutionary biology, and he reads a lot of Matt Ridley and that sort of thing. And he points out that when you go back and read these texts, they don't say anything about trade. You know, they don't, they don't even bring up uh, markets and trade is sort of a way that DNA transmits across time and across societies and how important uh, money has been in, in human development, even biology. Uh, so, but, you know, what, what strikes me in reading uh, chapter 14 is that he's talking about how, how, how we understand free market prices and how we calculate and it. But, but to understand how prices truly arise as opposed to how we want to think they arise, it all goes back to human action. And it, it, he's tying it back to the earlier chapters of the book. Right. He's building, he's building from those early chapters. And um, he's introducing then what he uh, adds here in this uh, chapter is the complexity of social phenomena. So if you think about Robinson Crusoe allocating his resources to uh, higher valued ends that he has and combining inputs in lower cost ways, that problem theoretically is pretty easy to analyze because Caruso can just make all these decisions in his head. <clears throat> but once we get to the social nexus and the division of labor, 
we had this huge extension of uh, production uh, through specialization of millions and millions of people. And, uh, you know, being uh, organized in all of this production by entrepreneurs engaged in monetary calculation. And so if you want to disentangle all the causal effects behind uh, generating the, the uh, array of prices in society, you have to have this method uh, that um, Mises talks about of the imaginary construction. Yeah, so it's interesting. I, again, he's setting up all kinds of foundational things, and the lay reader might wonder, well, gee, Dr. Herbert, do I need to know all this stuff? He talks about imaginary constructions. He talks about the pure market economy, which we're finding out is a very imaginary construction in 2020 America. He talks about the autistic economy, which you earlier mentioned, Robinson Crusoe. That's the idea of, of a human actor, let's say, alone on an island and making trade-offs and decisions without other economic actors, without money. Uh, the evenly rotating economy, and then the stationary economy. So just help us understand briefly, what, what are these constructs and what, how do they help us? What, why, do, why does economics need imaginary constructs? Well, again, uh, the basic reason is that <clears throat> real economies, which we're trying to explain, are exceedingly complex. So you already uh, mentioned this a couple of times. The outcomes we see in our own economy are a complex web of um, – uh, effects that come from uh, government intervention and monetary and fiscal policy and state-run enterprises and then some private property and market exchange. And so uh, in order to see what is causing the phenomena that we're interested in, let's say um, inflation in uh, uh, the money supply or uh, higher prices or economic uh, progress or whatever, we have to be able to separate out these different causal factors. And so that is really what uh, Mises is starting that process. Now, it takes him the rest of the book to do this in full, but he wants to start with the pure market economy to separate out all government intervention, all um, you know, state-run enterprises. He wants to, he wants to uh, limit the function of the state to simply defense a person and property and then see what would happen uh, in in a, uh, an economy that was uh, structured in this way, what would happen then to production and prices and economic progress? And would there be business cycles? And if so, what would they look like? How would financial markets develop and operate and so on? So do, do so-called mainstream economics textbooks like uh, Samuelson, do they have these breakdowns? Do they ever consider the idea of, of Robinson Crusoe economy? I would say not so much. They don't emphasize it. Uh, typically, the textbook would have a mainstream textbook would have a little introductory chapter on basic principles of human action or at least basic uh, uh, assumptions or claims about economic theorizing about uh, the economy. But typically, they jump right in. And th the, the list of imaginary constructs, uh, uh, usually called equilibrium states that conventional economists have are different because their whole orientation as a discipline is geared toward uh, describing the conditions of those equilibrium states, where when you read through Mises, you see that he's using this uh, technique of imaginary constructs. To take the example of ERE, he's using this in order to contrast the real world with the imaginary state. So he, he sets up uh, the ERE saying, what if we had a situation where no, no underlying factors were changing that would alter economic production processes? What if they just rotated over and over again? In other words, what if we eliminate uncertainty? And then he draws certain conclusions about the real world from uh, contrasting it with this imaginary state. So it's a much different procedure than uh, mainstream economists use. And it's another example. This really is a treatise. This isn't a textbook. This is a treatise that strips everything down to its bare essentials and starts with a real foundation. And of course, that's what economists don't want to do today. They want to just throw uh, really complex mathematical models at a bunch of data and come up with gibberish that doesn't help anybody, doesn't predict anything, uh, but they all get paid. So this that that's why I think this book is so important. And you know, as we go through it, for listeners, I always like to point out as a fan of language, first of all, how not just technically precise Mises' language is, 
And again, he's writing this in English, a second language for him in the 1940s, but also how beautiful it often is. I mean, I wish I could write like this guy, Uh, but also how applicable to today's crazed 2020 political and economic situation it is. And if you want an example of that, people who are reading through, uh, we're, again, we're w- using the scholar's edition here. At the at the bottom of page 235, he has a section called The Denial of Economics, which is so spot on today. I mean, there are millions of people in this country on the left who just think economics isn't even a real science, that you can just command and control economies. Well, there's a lot of people on the right, too. You can just command and control economies, and you can create economic outcomes by legislative fiat. And there's no real laws of economics. You know, there, there's a lot of people who believe that. So, so he was really spot on. But uh, Jeff, at the end of the chapter here, we're about to move on. But he he come, he mentions these uh, catalytic categories. You know, we hear these all the time: the factors of production. We hear about capitalists and landowners and workers and consumers. But he makes the I think the important point that these aren't silos; they're integrated with one another. As he calls it, there are uh, functions that are performed uh, by real people in uh, in the real economy. And so as he makes clear, uh, one person could um, perform several of these functions. A person could, let's say, run a business and save uh, up uh, past uh, earnings and then invest and be a capitalist in his or her own business. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, mom and pop uh, operations are like this where mom and pop even supply their labor and so they're both uh, you know to explain their behavior we have to think of them theoretically both in their function as a worker and in their function as an entrepreneur and in their function as a capitalist yeah and it's so uh irritating to to hear the left's caricature of small business owners i mean you know they're taking the delivery they're open the boxes they're stocking the shelves they're doing the cooking they're they're doing whatever they do because every as everybody who's actually owned a business knows cost of labor is huge uh, so as we get into chapter 15 typical me says he's got these ambitious titles this is an ambitious chapter it's just called the market i mean oh my god you, you, this is a an econ lesson in one chapter and so he starts off, you know, talking about what I think is so important for, for those of us in our camp to understand that this is all a social system. The division of labor is important. And he quickly makes the point, this isn't biology. So social competition is, isn't some doggy dog uh, state of nature. It's actually helpful. It's cooperation and that it, it gives us an, a, a level of material affluence that socialism has never matched. He makes that point. Yeah, it's a great point. And you're right, that's sort of the running theme throughout this chapter is uh, uh, the, it's, the features of um, the market economy. And he, he continuously makes these kinds of contrasts to socialism. And he's not scared to use the word capitalism. And it, it's also interesting that he has a lot of historical discussion about uh, real world uh, uh, economic systems as well as, uh, you know, using this conception of the uh, pure, what he calls a pure market economy. And, um, and, and you're right. One of the striking uh, points that he makes is the one you mentioned about competition, where he insists that, uh, and correctly, that um, competition in the market is done by uh, people who are competing to be more cooperative with other people, who are competing to better satisfy the uh, demands and preferences of other people. And so it isn't uh, law of the jungle, uh, as you say, biological competition. Uh, another very important uh, distinction that he makes about the market that's mischaracterized by its enemies. Yeah. And he also makes the point that civilization and private property go together. They're hand in hand, folks. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of people, even at our camp, want to downplay this idea or this point. But we're seeing this right now in in real time. I mean, we're seeing uh, the Trump administration tell people that they don't have to pay their mortgages or their rent for a while. Um, And, uh, you know, you wonder how you can organize an economy along those lines when people are that unsure of um, whether contracts are even honored. It's a crazy time. Yeah. He also mentions this uh, about, uh, about freedom. He also says the same thing with respect to private property is the foundation of freedom. And uh, again, this is a very powerful point and very robust and applicable to our day and age. We can see that uh, here in Pennsylvania, the governor, Governor Wolf, has actually declared martial law in some uh, counties and cities uh, 
and uh, under penalty of uh, arrest and fines, people are are sequestered in their houses unless they're essential workers. And so, so what? So you know, what does the Constitution matter? What do uh, what do the paper parchments uh, have to do with restraining this sort of thing? If we don't have the property rights of free freedom to use our property and move about and so on, well, we don't really have freedom at all. Yeah, and he shows very much his views here on freedom as something that is provided by the state. I mean, let's be let's be clear about this. He's you know not a natural law uh, guy. He's he's showing his utilitarian stripes and and his con- conception of freedom is not a Rothbardian. Uh, or a Hoppian, or even a Judge Andrew Napolitano conception. It's a utilitarian argument uh, that freedom's not found in the state of nature and that we have to sort of create the conditions and impose it. And we can get into all kinds of tangential arguments about that. But it, it's important that this, these are the kinds of uh, points in the book where uh, he demonstrates that he is a small-D Democrat and that he is someone who believes that in, in the role of the state, albeit that role being the protection of private property. And uh, that that's what makes it ever more interesting to read what he has to say about all of this, because it provokes us to think about these issues, uh, uh, you know, from other angles as well and to see whether or not uh, Mises is uh, is right to hold this particular conception. And one of the points he makes also in this chapter is, is something that's stressed by Hunter Hastings, for those of you who listen to our entrepreneurship uh, Economics for Entrepreneurship podcast, which is the concept of consumer sovereignty, which he touches on at several points in the book, but he mentions it here, and that we have this, this, uh, uh, you know, this idea, this sort of straw man concept in the West of mindless consumerism, and we're just these uh, consuming robots who want little trinkets and electronic pleasures all day long, and and Mises throws the burden on us uh, that consumers actually direct producers and capitalists. And I think uh, certainly a lot of people in this country think it's the other way around. Yeah, that's a great point. It, uh, it, it's a very again powerful and provocative uh, way of putting the argument where uh, Mises points out that all uh, prices in the economy and all incomes of all the producers, the profit and loss, uh, the rate of interest, everything, um, production patterns and so on, every, every detail of the market economy is uh, geared toward the satisfaction of consumers. And if we don't like what the market economy is doing, if we don't like the low wages of uh, uh, janitors or whatever, the, the reason is the consumers. It isn't, uh, it isn't the entrepreneur's fault. It isn't the, uh, you know, the capitalist's fault. It isn't the fault of big business or uh, any other uh, boogeyman. It, it's, it's us, as you, as you say, as you rightly point out. And he also makes the point that, that – you know, unlike an equilibrium model where profits in a society have to equal losses, that a market economy, it doesn't have to be a zero sum. It does have inequality as a feature, not as a bug, but nonetheless, there actually is a, a, a you know, and, and this seems to be lost amongst the zero summers, but there's actually a, a capitalist structure where uh, productivity and net gains are going up. And uh, you know, again, he, he uh, presents these ideas in a very uh, robust way, very provocative. And uh, I can only imagine what it would be like to be a lefty to uh, read through this book and be you know, stopped at, at every paragraph, shocked out of my senses. But, uh, but he's absolutely right in pointing all of this out. Uh, as, you, as you say, the inequality of wealth and income is a positive feature of the market economy. The market economy can't function uh, unless this is uh, permitted free play. And uh, of course, he's he spends some time contrasting that with what would happen to um, a wealth and income under uh, different systems, where they uh, the, the power of the state is used to try to force um, the natural differences that exist among persons and land sites and um, you know, entrepreneurial ability and so on, try by the, the force of law to suppress all that and make incomes equal. But this is this can't work. This is no more effective than price controls or any other kind of government uh, imposition. Yes, and I think I think throughout this book, again, writing it in the 1940s in the U.S., we have to think about the man and his own experiences. I think his view of the Nazi Party in Germany as an Austrian. 
it infuses every part of the book, having to flee Austria, his beloved Vienna, having, the, you know, then have to, to flee Switzerland. Uh, he has a little section at the end here where he talks about the Volkswirtschaft, excuse my pronunciation, where, where the, the sovereign nation's total complex of economic activities is all directed and controlled by the government, which was, of course, the Nazi model. And I think, I think he's taking pains to point this out because it's so fresh. And although this book is very timeless, it doesn't have a lot of super topical or timely uh, references to then current events. This is, I think, one of those points where it does. Yeah, that, that's an interesting, uh, interesting point to make. He, uh, you know, you did uh, have the opportunity to revise uh, human action in the second edition and third edition. Um, so he's almost, uh, well, almost not. Well, he's more than a decade uh, after the first publication. Of the first edition, and he didn't change any of any of those references. So it is it is quite interesting. I, I my take on it would be that he thinks that these are vivid illustrations of a more general category of problem. That, that's how I read his uh, his last section here on the market, where he's talking about the national impulse and how this creates something that's uh, antithetical to the market. Well, as we move on and out of this chapter, I want to give everybody a little nugget at the top of page 315. There's a paragraph about political parties, which is absolutely 100% on point today if you're watching this battle in the Senate and the House over this really wretched stimulus bill, what Pelosi's been doing and what Chuck Schumer's been doing and what Mitch McConnell had been doing. You know, he's talking about political parties uh, promise their supporters a higher real income. Well, that's always free stuff, in other words. And he said, I love this line, each party considers it an insidious plot against its prestige and its survival if somebody ventures to question the capacity of its projects to make the group members more prosperous. So, um, you know, if you're going to read this book, and it's it, not the easiest book to read, we, we get that. Uh, you got to, you know, enjoy those little bon mots that he drops from time to time. Uh, moving ahead, chapter 16. Wow, another ambitious title, another long, ambitious chapter. And that's why we're breaking up part four of this book, folks. We're just doing the first few chapters, and it will do the, the, re, the rest in the show next week. But, you know, this is several hundred pages of material just in the first few chapters of this part. And chapter 16, a similarly ambitious topic and title, it's just called Prices. So, Jeff, here he gets into what he's touched on earlier in the book. You know, all we can do... Uh, comparatively in terms of value is is apply ordinal preferences for A over B. But that preference has to find its expression uh, and, and make the leap from value to price. And price, market prices, is how it finds that expression. So this, this whole chapter sort of starts with that. Right, that's correct. So now he wants to get into the actual details of explaining how the uh, pricing process functions uh, conceptually. And uh, that's the first issue, right? What is the uh, relationship between the subject and values we have in, in our minds as consumers and producers and entrepreneurs that uh, all of our decisions are based upon? We're just looking at alternatives and rank ordering uh, what we think the value of them will be and choose accordingly. And the actual objective cardinal prices that come about through uh, our interactions with each other. What is that connection? That's what he's trying to uh, grapple with. And of course, he he makes the you know fairly standard kind of um, I, I mean his approach is not standard, but he makes a fairly standard kind of a conclusion um, about that uh, relationship that the prices of consumer goods are just reflections of the uh, marginal value that's placed upon the good by consumers that, uh, determined right at the market clearing point. Well, help us to understand what higher and lower order goods are. Okay, so there, what Mises is referring to is the second step of the problem. Once you figure out how consumer goods are determined, which is the easier uh, explanation, you have to then figure out the relationship between consumer goods prices and producer goods prices. And then what you would do, of course, is you proceed to one production process and look at that. But after you do that, let's say it's consumers buying automobiles, and then you look at the auto entrepreneur comparing costs uh, with revenues in production and how the, on, uh, the auto entrepreneur is demanding factors of production 
because the customers are providing revenue to the entrepreneur to buy the factors. Uh, but then you have, uh, since all production is interconnected, you have to go to the next step. So now you have to explain where the prices of the materials come from and the uh, uh, assets come from that the uh, uh, auto entrepreneur has acquired and, and is using. And so you have to move to these uh, so-called higher orders. And so that that's the distinction between higher order goods would be goods that are uh, uh, earlier chronologically in the process of production, like iron mined out of the ground or trees cut in the forest. And then these go through s- sequential steps of production and exchange through the production of intermediate capital goods and then on down to the production of the consumer good. So we have iron mined out of the ground and then steel made and then fenders for the car and then the car is assembled. And <clears throat> all of this is integrated. And so what Mises' uh, task here is to explain the connection in prices uh, between consumer goods and then all of the higher order uh, producer goods. But we all play a role here, right? I mean, we're, we're the consumers. We're buying so-called lower order or retail goods. If we go and look at a Honda Accord and we say, well, gee whiz, I like it. I think I'll pay twenty eight or $30,000 for it. But if, if it's $35,000, that's kind of an ouch point and I'm not going to pay that much and I'm going to go look at another car. So, so our behavior... Uh, it, it, at the end of lower order prices, actually I- influences higher order prices. Yeah, that's exactly the point that he's trying to stress. And and notice again how this uh, comports with um, with Robinson Crusoe. You see exactly the same kind of um, relationship between the subjective value that Caruso plays uh, or puts on, uh, let's say, having fish as a consumer good, and the um, value that he places on a net uh, for catching the fish and then the value he places on the materials that and the labor used in making the net so we can see that this connection is uh is human nature it's built into the the way in which we are as human persons but it's also doing damage isn't it to the labor theory of value and to the cost or of of production a concept of value that the classical economists had i mean it doesn't matter how much it costs uh throughout the chain to make a Honda Accord, if no one will buy it for 35, it's not going to be 35. So he has to overturn the cost of production theory. And uh, that's why his next section, after talking about prices of uh, goods of higher order, is to talk about cost accounting. Because what, what he's driving at in that section is to explain, uh, as they would say in finance, asset prices. Pointing out that if, if Honda produces these uh, you know, Accords and asks a price of 35000 and they don't uh, sell, and the losses are suffered, and their costs are, you know, whatever, 33000 to produce the car, whatever they are, and then what will happen is the asset prices that Honda is using in that production process, since they're generating losses, will fall commensurately. And, uh, and, and then this will indicate what should be done with respect to those resources reallocated into, you know, the factories, the equipment should be reallocated into a different line of uh, – uh, automobiles, or maybe even into a different line of production altogether. And this, of course, then gets him into the thorny questions of uh, the convertibility of these capital goods and so on and so forth. But he, but this is the basic way in which cost of production adjusts. The wages that Honda pays and that the workers that Honda hires uh, may not vary much when they're laid off and they have to find jobs in other auto companies, as long as their you know, demand for those uh, cars uh, produced there hasn't gone down, uh, but the assets used will will fall commensurately with the losses that are involved. Do you think his little foray in this chapter into uh, really an attack on mathematical or quantitative economics? Do you think he overstates his case? He's pretty harsh, <laughs> right? And, it, and the reason he is is because uh, what Mises is showing here is that this whole process of uh, pricing in the market economy is entrepreneurial. It's all speculative and it's driven by entrepreneurial foresight. And this is the one feature, well, there, maybe there are others, but this is the main feature, maybe I should say, uh, that's completely eliminated in all mathematical treatments of the question of economics. Mathematics can only deal with uh, the, the equilibrium states. And uh, Mises even takes time to point out that uh, even if mathematical economists try to map out a step-by-step process by which the end state is met, uh, 
this is not an entrepreneurial process. It's not done in real time. It's not done by the judgment of actual human persons. Uh, it, it, it doesn't incorporate mistakes that uh, the entrepreneurs naturally make uh, because they're fallible. Um, through the process, it doesn't talk about the self-selection of different people into the entrepreneurial ranks when some fail and so on and so forth. All of, all of the real dimensions of an actual economy are drained out. Yeah, it's pretty bloodless. I, I, and I, that's what's so great about this book is it really brings this stuff to life, at least for me. Um, it, and as a lay reader, uh, it, it's, it really is a fascinating read. Now, he has a, a section, several pages on monopolies and government. He, he mostly recognizes monopolies as arising from some, some form of state privilege. Uh, he, he did have some ideas about uh, natural resources and that sort of thing, maybe mining. Uh, but, did, you know, briefly discuss his treatment here of monopoly and government versus, let's say, what people consider Roth, Rothbard's uh, later treatment. Some people think Rothbard improved upon or even corrected Mises when it comes to monopoly theory. Right. So, so again, it's kind of a technical point. But what Mises argues is that a monopoly, in order to be injurious to consumer sovereignty, in order not, in other words, to as fully as possible, given the costs and conditions of demands and so on, to uh, generate the most consumer satisfaction in the use of resources, the monopolist must not only control the supply of some particular uh, input, let's say you mentioned the mining, so we use that as an example, like De Beers owning all the diamond mines in the world, but when they offer for sale the diamonds uh, in, in uh, you know the next stage of production, the demand at Mises sees the demand is uh, inelastic at what would be the competitive price, which just means that the monopolist can restrict the price and hold some of the supply back from sale, and the holding back of that supply is injurious to the consumer's uh, demands. Uh, because their demands do, in fact, justify the use of that supply relative to other things. So the consumers not getting that additional supply that's being restricted would uh, shift and, and demand other things that they prefer less. And so that, that's how Mises conceives of the harm done by monopoly. And he, as you suggest, he takes page after page here, quite a bit of uh, effort to categorize the different cases. And uh, you know, of course, he, he subdivides, as you've already pointed out, between government-imposed uh, monopoly, which always creates this harm to consumer sovereignty, and market monopoly, which almost never does. It's a very special case. And then what Rothbard did was uh, he, he criticized Mises, I think on um, justifiably here, on the ground that Mises' argument depends upon uh, uh, we as the economists being able to perceive what the competitive price would have been in the absence of the monopoly. And that's something that we, we cannot know. There isn't any way for, the, for us as economists to say whether or not some restriction of supply uh, was generated by a, a monopoly holding, moving up a demand curve and restricting it in an inefficient way, or just something like, uh, you know, building inventory and in anticipation of selling in the future. There, there just isn't any way for us to ascertain this or to put the case even a little bit more strongly. Rothbard said, look, every seller, no matter what the market conditions, will always try to get the maximum revenue from uh, selling the output. Once the costs are born and sunk, uh, once the, uh, you know, all the cars are on the dealer's lot and the costs have been incurred, the best solution is to price the product to get the maximum revenue. And that will always be uh, at the midpoint of demand. It doesn't matter if you have a monopoly or a, you're in an in a industry with a thousand other firms, gen, you know, all producing homogeneous units of a good. Every uh, entrepreneur has exactly the same um, a situation and therefore will act in exactly the same way. They'll restrict their supply out to the point where they're maximizing their revenue. And we can't then distinguish a monopoly restriction from, uh, from any other firm. Uh, 
Yeah, it is fascinating to think about, and especially now we're in a digital age where we have social media companies, which I view as pretty evil for the most part. Uh, do they have some sort of digital monopoly? I would probably argue no. Uh, you bring up De Beers. And now De Beers have been around for a long time. Diamonds have been around for a long time. So to me, that's a little more interesting case because we can look at that over time. And I'll just throw this out as an anecdote. My wife happens to have an heirloom piece, which contains a diamond, which belonged to her grandmother that she cares about. And uh, so she actually went out, took the setting, which apparently is not no, no big deal, and got a cubic zirconia fake diamond made for 50 bucks or something that fits in it so that she can put the real piece, the real diamond in a safe deposit box or someplace and use the cubic zirconia one. So, you know, that's it's fascinating to think about how things work around. I mean, by by all accounts, cubic zirconia is actually uh, flawless and better in in a certain not not in a you know value is subjective. I get that, but in a certain uh, pure pure sense of appearance, color, brilliance, cut, cubic zirconia is perhaps superior to a De Beers diamond. So even if you're De Beers, and you've been around forever, and you and People have wanted diamonds forever, and you know you're literally digging something out of the ground, which is a very difficult uh, process. You, you still got trouble. You still got trouble. It's called the cubic zirconia people. Yeah, that's that's an excellent illustration of the point, the general point that Mises makes about uh, the dynamic of the market, and uh, he makes this with respect mainly to cartels in this section. But that's the point, right? If the monopoly is really getting this monopoly uh, price then it just uh, gives incentive for others, uh, entrepreneurs to spring up and offer some sort of a substitute. And given enough time and technological development, they'll come up with something. And, and the monopoly gain is then eroded away. He makes this point towards the end of the chapter about prices. And, and this goes back, we've already covered in previous episodes, we went through his book, Socialism, and, and his uh, article about socialism and economic calculation. Uh, he makes this point where he says prices cannot be, quoting him, constructed synthetically because they come from, again, quoting him, a constellation of market data. I thought that was fascinating because imagine how much wider and broader that constellation is in 2020 versus in the 1940s. I mean, the the idea of price setting is still with us and and we can't seem to get rid of it. We can't seem to disabuse politicians and bureaucrats of this notion, but... I, I thought the idea that, that it comes from a constellation of market data was really well put. Yeah, it's another place where his uh, his uh, rhetoric flourishes and, and really uh, stimulates our mind to think about these things in ways that we haven't before. Uh, and you're quite right. The, the more the market develops and the more complex and advanced it becomes, it, it, it's actually... Uh, I think the case that we need the state less and less because we, we're so wealthy. We, we have the wealth uh, sufficient to provide for the poor. We, um, we're so uh, mobile and uh, so on and so forth. And we have all this um, advancing uh, capital accumulation that allows us to feed people more readily and shelter them and deal with their actual physical problems and what have you. Um, and the government is, is just plodding along, interfering with this process at every turn, imposing price controls, and then entrepreneurs simply find ways to get around this to minimize their uh, negative impact, and people adapt and uh, move on. And it's just an interference. It's just another roadblock. Uh, and, and, uh, it, and Mises was quite right then to emphasize the, the development of the market as uh, providing us an opportunity, more and more opportunities to uh, evade and get around these roadblocks. When we talk about the entrepreneur, we talk about the structure of production. We talk about higher and lower order goods. We talk about the time and the capital investment, the risk of loss, and all of these things. To, give me your opinion. Am I overstating this? That outside of the Austrian tradition, most economists really don't deal much at all with the structure of production and especially the intertemporal element of that, the, the idea that capital is homogeneous versus heterogeneous. Uh, is that an overstatement or is that true? Is this something that Austrians have owned? I think that's a fair statement. Um, about the only place where you see anything uh, 
related to this issue of the capital structure, or at least the interconnectedness of different production processes, is in uh, certain microeconomic analyses. And so, you know, uh, it's not unusual to find a mainstream economist who will talk about the kind of secondary effects of price controls, that they don't just impact the market they're directed toward, but the, uh, you know, the wages of the workers in this market and, and, and then moving them into other uh, lines of production, let's say, and then wages go down there. So it is kind of a sense that the uh, market is interconnected. But as you suggest, what's really missing most uh, prominently is the intertemporal nature of, of the production process. That seems to be almost completely absent from mainstream treatments. They, they may, as Mises points out, uh, they may have some notion of time in their mathematical models, but it's just a mathematical progression. And it isn't, it, it lacks the notion of intertemporal um, uh, differences. Well, as we get into the final chapter we're going to deal with today, Chapter 17, Indirect Exchange, uh, again, we're getting his full treatment of a lot of uh, topics he's covered in earlier books, like uh, the Theory of Money and Credit, which we did on the show uh, almost a year ago now. So the, he starts out this chapter talking about, you know, well, people don't want to barter. Barter is inefficient. They need a commodity and they need a means. So he really gets into a, a lengthy discussion of the media, media of exchange, and he actually gives us a nice definition of a medium of exchange. So this is – a lot of this feels like um, a, a, a new expression of some of the topics from theory of money and credit. Right. He, he wants to provide a, a more accessible uh, organizational structure, I think, is what he's doing. So you'll see at the end of theory of money and credit, he's got an – I think it's in the appendix. He's got a, um, a, a topology of media of exchange, and and he's doing this the same thing here, but he's he's using it in in a slightly different context, and so he's he's trying to introduce it sort of piece by piece, and so he talks about uh, a medium of exchange as anything used to facilitate exchange, and then from that notion he he moves to money, so money the general medium of exchange. And he wants to make that distinction plain because uh, the existence of money is the prerequisite for monetary calculation. And so he wants to be able to explain uh, how money comes about, what distinguishes it from other uh, media of exchange, and then uh, you know why this is important. And basically, again, the distinction he's making is this distinction between the medium of exchange that's used for monetary calculation, which is money, and media of exchange that are not, like uh, he talks about secondary media of exchange, uh, like an example today would be Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. So some people use that to, to facilitate their exchanges, but it's just um, it's a minor element of the overall exchanges in the uh, economy. And nobody thinks they can take Bitcoin and uh, use it generally, that everybody accepts it and so on. And nobody keeps their... Uh, accounts in Bitcoin, uh, this is all done by money. And so he, he needs to be able to make this distinction and then show why this distinction comes about through the actions that people take. Why don't we think about, when I say we, I mean Americans, why don't we think about supply and demand for money the same way we think about supply and demand for other goods or services? I think it, that lets politicians get away with a lot of uh, nefarious activity. Yes, absolutely it does. And so that's one of the main things that uh, Mises um, develops or uh, really just repeats uh, this argument about um, that he, this pioneering argument that he made back in theory of money and credit that we can, in fact, apply just regular supply and demand analysis to money. And uh, if we can do this, this just means that we can explain everything about money, its purchasing power, that is its exchange value on the market, uh, its demand and supply and so on and so forth, its production. We can explain all of that in the same way that we explain every other uh, good and the, its production and exchange and demand and supply. And therefore, we have a general theory uh, of all market phenomena that stems uh, out of uh, the basis of human action itself. And as you suggest, it's this bifurcation, it's this dichotomy uh, to think of money as outside of that explanatory nexus that creates all sorts of both theoretical and, uh, and uh, policy uh, 
problems. Yeah, and one of those problems is that we tend to imagine the purchase, the future purchasing power of our money will look something like its recent or past purchasing power, and that may not be true. And there are several points and places and times in history where that was decidedly not true, and a lot of people suffered as a result. Inflation is an insidious killer, literally and figuratively, and it, hyperinflation is something we don't even want to think about, uh, uh, how ugly that could be. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned Bitcoin, and he, he brings up a point where when we're talking about good or decent money, commodity money, it needs a past that people have to have some past to, to see that it's been accepted and that it's held some value and, and, and such and such. So I guess I'll put you on the spot a little bit. Do you What's the Jeffrey Herbner view on whether or not Bitcoin has enough of a past or a commodity value to, to represent, at least in the future, potentially, it's up to the market, it's not up to you or me, but at least potentially in the future to represent a, a real uh, day-to-day money? Well, sure. I think in principle, it, it could become a, a money. Uh, but this, again, is an empirical question, really, as to whether or not people would choose it or, let's say, on the other side, whether uh, politicians would suppress it legally like they do gold and so on, uh, as to whether it actually performs this function. But yet, right, any any tradable good could um, could start the process, uh, you know, that Mises rehearses about uh, Carl Menger's uh, story of the origin of money. It, it, any commodity could start that process as long as it starts as a traded good. It would then have to demonstrate or people would have to come to uh, at least uh, believe or perceive that it is superior in some respects to the uh, money that they're using now. And so I think the barriers against Bitcoin, the practical barriers against Bitcoin becoming money are pretty sizable. But in principle, I think it could become money. And of course, the IRS is treating it as a capital good, so you need yeah. to pay a tax every time, or at least uh, suffer a gain or loss, potentially taxable every time you exchange Bitcoin for something. So that's you know just the compliance cost of tracking that is brutal. You don't want to go buy a sandwich every day at uh, Starbucks with Bitcoin and have to to figure out whether that was a gain or a loss. Um, Mises talks here about commodity money versus credit money. He he also gets into money substitutes which is really what credit money is. And, and he, he says that's not bad per se. In other words, there's nothing wrong with a money substitute, a certificate that represents a claim to money. There's nothing wrong with that per se, and the economy would demand that on its own. But once it loses its character as a claim, an actual claim against a bank, it risks becoming fiat money. So you know, help us, help us with this concept of commodity money and credit money and money substitutes and then ultimately fiduciary media. We all hear these terms, but they're a little murky for some of us. And of course, he proceeds in the in the logical fashion, starting with the more basic and uh, explains commodity money. And here, of course, uh, the example he uses is the gold standard, just to have a concrete idea in our head about what he's referring to. But uh, if we had uh, an unhampered market economy, and so the government is doing nothing but defending person and property, um, then money production would be left to private enterprise. And, uh, you know, it seems reasonable to think that uh, private enterprise would at least, at least historically, they would have produced uh, a commodity money, um, gold coins or silver coins. And then it follows from that, if that happens, it follows that the production of money is then integrated into the uh, production of all things in the economy. And therefore, all the entrepreneurial decisions about producing money, my, you know, uh, having a mining operation, getting the gold out of the ground, uh, setting up a minting facility and minting coins and so on, is, uh, is uh, just as efficient uh, as and, you know, satisfying of consumer sovereignty as the production of anything else. And so there we have, we have a system where there's no monetary inflation or deflation. Every um, uh, increase in the production of money has been justified by uh, increased demand to have that money uh, to the extent that uh, the resources used to produce it uh, are efficiently allocated into that production. And so that's the baseline that he starts with. And uh, then he moves on to these other cases, right? So let's do money substitutes next. So 
Money substitutes we could imagine also developing just on the unhampered market economy. As long as the claims were um, airtight, so Mises says that a money substitute only exists on the unhampered market when it's a perfectly secure redemption claim. So the person holding it can redeem it on demand at par, no questions asked, anytime um, uh, against the issuing uh, organization. <clears throat> anytime that's in doubt, uh, then the money su substitute loses its uh, medium of exchange character. And so, as he, he so he speaks about money substitutes, and then uh, fiduciary media is when um, the issuer of the money substitute, like a bank, would issue a quantity of the money substitute that's in excess of the reserve uh, that the money substitute can be redeemed into. So this is where we get fractional reserve banking, <clears throat> and Mises says that uh, fractional reserve fiduciary media um, could be part of uh, a market economy as long as banks are uh, independent, as long as we have competition, uh, you know, a market uh, competition in banks. Because then uh, anytime a bank would overissue fiduciary media, uh, non-clients of the bank would get paid by the clients of the bank in, in these claims, and they would redeem them at the issuing bank. Uh, it's also true that competing banks could hoard up a fiduciary media of uh, their competition and then present them all at once for redemption. And so Mises thinks that th there'd be a small amount of fiduciary issue in a in a genuinely free banking system, uh, and but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be uh, progressing enough to generate uh, uh, business cycle difficulties. So so that's the basic. Uh, uh, analysis that he gives of uh, money substitutes. And then credit money, he talks about as a theoretical type. And as you pointed out, this is uh, a money that starts as a, a, a money substitute. And then for some reason, the redemption claim is broken. And, and yet people continue to use it. And unless the redemption claim is restored sometime in the future, uh, such a thing can become a fiat money. And uh, one example for everyone to think about uh, with respect to this is the U.S. notes um, that the Lincoln administration issued in, uh, during the Civil War. That's true that they started out as fiat money. But uh, remember, in the 1870s, Congress passed the Resumption Act and um, uh, promised to uh, restore redemption of the U.S. notes in gold uh, by 1879. And when they did that, then... Uh, well, in the interim, before they accomplished that, the uh, exchange ratio between the U.S. notes and gold moved toward par because people trading with this uh, money substitute believed the claim uh, that the um, U.S. government made that they would redeem again of this note. So we do have some examples of credit money. And of course, we do. We also have examples of uh, like the Treasury Department in the 19th century. And then into the 20th century, um, uh, removing the redemption claim on uh, treasury certificates. And so, so we have that uh, case uh, of uh, potential credit money that turns into fiat money. Yeah, it's fascinating to watch this. Obviously, we all have our concerns about the actual U.S. dollar, which is totally unsecured and, and not redeemable for anything at, um, with, with, at the you know, with the U.S. Treasury. Uh, it's still redeemable for goods and services uh, in the general U.S. economy, still required to pay your taxes, by the way. Uh, I just wonder, you know, there's this whole concept of shadow banking. It's a huge topic unto itself, and it's a very underappreciated and underexamined topic. But in a, an environment like this, you see uh, Goldman Sachs issues its own bonds, for example. You see uh, treasury bills and treasury notes almost starting to approximate uh, money in a sense because they're traded all, in almost as liquid a fashion as dollars are. So once government gets involved as, first of all, the, the sole bank of, in a sense, the sole provider of money in the economy and, uh, you know, not, not backing that money by gold or anything else, it, it's amazing how, the, how bizarre things get in a modern economy. Yeah, that's a really good, uh, really good illustration of this. Uh, 
and and once again to think about Mises's structure and analyzing this kind of thing, uh, this would just be another uh, case, a very interesting case of where the government to, begins to interfere with the natural, unhampered market economy activity. And every time they step up their interference, uh, the people in the economy act in an entrepreneurial way to adapt to it. And this means that they take up what seem to be really strange practices uh, that they would never take up in the unhampered market economy. Uh, but they do it because they see it as a uh, superior alternative to um, uh, sticking with and bearing the imposition that the government is placing on them with their fiat money and, uh, and central banking and so on. Yeah, it's spooky. I think what's going to happen in the coming months and years is we're going to start to ask ourselves again, what is money and who says so? I think those questions are going to, you know, these questions we thought we solved a long time ago. Um, he does get into the idea of, of uh, money across countries. And so you have different nationalities. He's writing this coming out of the patchwork. Uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of shakeups in the map of Europe coming out of World War One and then World War Two when he's writing this book. Uh, and so you've got a lot of different currencies. This is, of course, prior to the Eurozone and the Euro. So when we're talking about monies, you know, different nationalities, different countries issuing money, uh, there was one good worldwide money called gold. And as long as things were redeemable in that, that provided a, a huge amount of uh, coherence and certainty for people. Uh, but once you sever that link, things get a little more dodgy. But nonetheless, there certainly are advantages. If you look at the Eurozone, uh, those of us who might travel to Europe, it's kind of convenient not to have to have Deutsche Marks and French francs and, and you know, to exchange all these currencies for a little bit of, of a fee every time you cross the border. So there's something to be said for uh, one money or one widely accepted money. But there's also something to be said for competition because you have now all these different central banks and all these different countries going crazy. And maybe if somewhere, whether that's Switzerland, they haven't been too good lately, but um, – Liechtenstein or somewhere, you know, maybe somewhere there's a central bank that is going to go less crazy and look better as a result. So I, I think, it, you know, given what, 60 years of hindsight since he wrote this, uh, 75 years of hindsight, uh, you know, there, there's something to be said for competition amongst currencies, even if it's not the kind of competition you and I might want to see private, but national. Right. Yeah, I think that's right. I think this is just another, again, another example of um, decentralization of political control that is, uh, in principle, always uh, advantageous uh, to to us. Um, uh, so we can think of you know many different examples of this, but it's always uh, beneficial to us to have um, a, a, an avenue of escape, a place where we can move out of uh, more oppressive. Government control and uh, and uh, flourish in where government control is less oppressive. And uh, you may uh, remember Ralph Rako's great work on the uh, uh, Europe in the medieval age, where that system, the system of decentralized polities, worked uh, quite effectively to restrain the extent to which any one of the polities could exploit, uh, especially merchants who could move readily between these polities. And so that same principle applies even in our world. It, uh, it's, it's always beneficial to have the political power uh, decentralized. Yeah, we're even seeing that between governors in the U.S. right now, making decisions about whether they're going to impose outright martial law and nobody can go anywhere, or whether they're at least slightly open for business. It's a fascinating thing to think about. Uh, I want to leave you, Dr. Herbner, with this. Uh, at the end of this chapter, he gets he talks a little bit about the gold standard and why bimetallism failed. And he also talks about why uh, in inflationists it, it insist that expansionism uh, yields prosperity. And we're seeing a lot of expansionism with respect to the Fed's balance sheet that we're going to here. I, I suspect it's going to go from about $5 trillion now uh, to uh, – I, I would not be shocked to see the Fed's balance sheet, which, which by, by which I mean the monetary base, uh, go to $10 trillion. Over the next, uh, you know, how many? No, God knows how many bailouts over the next few years. Uh, so, you know, talk talk about what is what is expansionism? Why is it always so politically favored, and why doesn't it work? Mises also calls it you know, inflationism—the idea that 
economic progress can only proceed if prices are generally rising. And, you know, it, it, it's a naive businessman fallacy, I suppose, in one sense. Uh, it could be that, uh, you know, uh, you have an entrepreneur who thinks that this is a, this sort of a structure of movement of prices is beneficial for business not realizing that markets uh, will adapt to uh, the financial markets in particular will adapt to expectations about uh, the state of rising prices. But, uh, but more fundamentally, of course, since this is driven by politics, since the politicians control the underlying uh, cause of uh, the progressing price structure, which is their control of money production, uh, they're doing it for their own interests. They're thinking about uh, how this affects their own interests. <clears throat> and uh, since uh, well, one aspect of this, of course, is that uh, the federal government is a huge debtor. And uh, by engaging in this kind of uh, steady price inflation, they can at least uh, for a while um, uh, reduce the extent of the, the real extent of those debts. So there, there's some impetus that way. Uh, but as Mises points out in the chapter, he does this uh, conceptual example where he says, you know, suppose you had a situation like in the 19th century where there was general price deflation. Then what would the entrepreneurs think? And, and he says, well, then the entrepreneurs would think, you know, this is great. This is how business progresses because uh, our cost structure keeps going down and we can then, uh, you know, uh, widen our market by lowering our prices and sell more. And, and this is great. And how could the world be otherwise? So, uh, so, I, so again, I, I would come back uh, to the driving force behind this being the, the uh, political interests uh, that are involved. And uh, oftentimes it's this practical problem of bailouts that you've uh, pointed out. You know, it's not so much that the politicians think, you know, steady price inflation is a good thing for paying off our debts. They're just inflating in order to bail out their uh, special interests. Yeah, it's short-term thinking at its worst. And of course, what we need for once in this country is some long-term thinking. So all that said, ladies and gentlemen, let's all thank Dr. Jeffrey Herbner for his time today. Really a fascinating discussion. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Uh, you can find the book at Mises.org. Just look up Human Action. You can go to our bookstore if you'd like to get a physical copy of it. It's one of those books you ought to have in your hands on your bookshelf and not just on your Kindle, in my opinion. But uh, I'm a little old-fashioned when it comes to these great books. Uh, we, we're selling it at a very low price. You can use the code HAPOD, which stands for Human Action Podcast, to get a discount on the book. And you know, most importantly, if you're just home, you can read it for free in a great searchable HTML format, very user-friendly uh, at our website. So we encourage you to, you know, take some time with this book. If you have a little extra time right now in your life and we'll be back next week, delving uh, even further into uh, part four. And eventually we're going to work our way through this entire book over the coming weeks. It's, it's, it's a real pleasure and an honor for me to just spend some time with it, uh, every week as I read certain, reread certain chapters and sections. And, uh, you know, that said, uh, Dr. Herbner, we really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's been a pleasure. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.